Okay guys, here's our first video segment for the thermodynamics unit. Uh, we're working in unit 10, which is uh, chapter 17 in our current book. And we're going to work through here, uh, run some video segments for you to use as we go through the unit. Uh, one of the first things we need to talk about is energy within this unit and talk about what is energy and kind of how we use energy. So what I'd like to do is kind of talk about the official definition of it and then kind of apply it back to some things that you may be more comfortable with in terms of your real life. So when we define energy, we talk about it being the ability to do work or cause change. Now that's kind of abstract in nature because you can't grab energy, we can't hold energy in our hands. It's not matter, it's kind of a cousin of matter. It's this entity in our universe that is intertwined in everything we do in our daily lives, just like just as much as matter is. Um, I think the idea of energy people are pretty comfortable with, but actually having to define it can be challenging for some people. Now, when we do measure energy, the SI unit for that is the joule. Uh, and then in terms of the joule, the joule comes from the kinetic energy required to move til 2 kilograms, 1 meter per second. Okay, um, Basically, that's a way that we kind of define a joule. Um, however, again, that's kind of abstract for us in terms of what does that mean. Okay, um, A term that you might be more familiar with is the calorie. Okay, so there's 4.18 joules in one calorie. Now, a calorie as we see it, uh, as it being the calories for food items and those kind of things, that is not the same calories we're talking about here. Now, um, food calories are capitalized. Uh, normal calories are not capitalized. The capital C in a calorie stands for a kilocalorie. So there's basically a thousand calories that we deal with in the science world in one food calorie. Okay, so if you imagine, um, let's say a Snickers bar. Snickers bar has 273 calories in it. Okay, um, if you wonder why I know that, it's because it's in the presentation later on uh, as we go through these notes. Um, so if there's 273 calories in that as a food calorie, that means there's 273,000 <clears throat> of these little calories, which means if we want to convert that to joules, it'd be 273,000 times 4.18. So we're talking over what 10 over a million plus joules there so we're talking about a joule being a really really small amount of energy okay to give you an idea if that's a two kilogram mass and it moves across the screen like that if that's one meter at one meter per second that's only a joules worth of energy so it's a really small amount of energy as a result we usually use joules in kilojoules instead or we usually sorry we usually use energy in kilojoules instead now, when we're working with this idea of thermodynamics, we have to talk about two different terms, heat versus temperature. Commonly, when I first talk to students and I say, what does heat mean to you, what does temperature mean to you, a lot of people say, well, when you increase temperature, it, you get hotter or there's more heat, which is not a false statement. That is true. Um, however, there's also this connotation that heat has to be hot, and that's a kind of a, an impression or a kind of a myth we want to dispel here. Uh, heat is actually officially a measure of energy. So when you, when you say the word heat, you're talking about the total amount of energy in a system. So it's all the energy that's present. So you can have heat in a system and it would feel cold to us because we also have heat energy. And if our heat energy just happens to be more than the one that's around us, it would feel cold to us. So if you can, try to quit thinking of heat as being hot in regards to what we're doing here. Uh, really is heat is just another way of saying energy. Now temperature measures the average of kinetic energy in a system. So temperature, as that goes up, that correlates back to being hot and cold. Okay, So when we talk about things being hot or being cold, temperature is a better term to use in terms of discussing that, not using the word heat. Okay, So if we go to the next slide, if we see here, um, we have the Atlantic Ocean, with that's kind of a whale's fin sticking out, and we have this nice hot tub sitting here. The Atlantic Ocean is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Uh, well, it's colder in some places, it's warmer in other places. And a hot tub, about 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, So between these two things, if I were to ask you which one is hotter, um, it's pretty obvious that you know the hot tub, 102, is bigger than 50, so this one is definitely hotter. But if we ask the question, which one has more heat? Okay, And this is where you, again, have to get rid of that idea that heat means hot. So if you think about it, we're talking about the Atlantic Ocean. We're not talking about a little bit of the Atlantic Ocean. We're talking about the entire Atlantic Ocean. So the entire Atlantic Ocean, how much energy is there? 
for that for that ocean. Okay, if you think about, it, there's a lot of energy in the Atlantic Ocean. That water is able to absorb lots of energy. So because the, there's so much water here, even though it's cooler than the hot tub, which is hotter, the Atlantic Ocean actually contains more heat energy. Okay, so this idea of heat is definitely based on how much you have of something. So it's definitely possible to have something that is colder but contain more heat energy than something that is hotter and be less of it. Okay, an example I usually use in class is we take a boiling hot uh, pan full of water. Now, nobody in their right mind would stick their hand in boiling hot pan full of water because it was way too hot, everybody always tells me. Okay? Which is true, it is too hot. Um, however, if I put one drop of boiling hot water on your hand, it may not feel good, but it's not going to scald you and burn you um, and make send you to the hospital. That one drop is just as hot, but it doesn't contain nearly as much heat energy. Okay, so because the pan of water has so many more water molecules there, their collective energy is way more than one drop of the same temperature of water. Okay, so that's kind of our idea between heat and temperature. Keep that in mind as we go through this unit because we'll be using the word heat all the time through this unit. And if every time you hear heat, you think it has to be hot, you're going to have a misconception as we work through this unit. Now, when we talk about... Uh, energy, we had to go back to our terms endothermic and, and, and exothermic and make sure that we're really solid with that. So when we deal with endothermic processes, is any time you bring energy in, okay? Um, we can do a touch test with those things because we actually have a sense, you know, we can feel hot and cold in our hands. So if you're holding something that was pulling heat in, would it feel hot or cold to us, okay? So if there's an endothermic process within our system, is that going to feel hot or cold to us? Well, if it's pulling energy in, it has to be pulling it from our hand. So that would feel cold to us, okay? Um, that would be energy moving in. I'm going to challenge you to take this one step further, though. Um, just because it feels hot or cold to us doesn't necessarily mean it has to be endothermic or exothermic, okay? It does in reference to our hand, but the process, you always go back to asking yourself one question. Whatever I'm studying, the system, or what I'm actually researching or studying or focusing on, is the system taking energy in or is it releasing it, okay? Anytime energy gets pulled in, it has to be considered endothermic, okay? If you flip that idea and you go exothermic, anytime the system is releasing energy, then that's exothermic, okay? Or energy is being pushed out of that system. Same idea here. Typically, if something is exothermic, if we were to touch it, now our hand isn't the system. Our hand would be considered part of the surroundings. So what would happen is our, it would feel hot to us because the system is releasing heat energy. Our hand absorbs that energy, and it feels hot because we're taking the energy in, and the system here is releasing it, being exothermic. Keeping that in mind, let's talk about melting and boiling. So if you have something that is melting or boiling, they basically is mimicking process. Melting is going from solid to liquid. Boiling is going from liquid to gas. So we're moving the same direction on the heating curve. Okay? To melt something, do we need to take energy in or do we need to release energy? Well, we're going from a solid to a liquid, and we know liquids have a higher energy state. So to move from solid to liquid, you have to absorb energy. So if it's absorbing energy... By definition, it's endothermic. Okay? Now, the same thing applies to boiling, because by absorbing energy, you can go from the liquid state to the gaseous state. So when you are boiling, you are also endothermic, okay? which melting seems to be easy for students to kind of grasp. The boiling one is a little bit harder for you to swallow sometimes, because to us it feels hot, because we always assume we're boiling water. Now, keep in mind, boiling just means you're moving from the, the liquid to the gas state. There are lots of substances in our world that boil below room temperature. Uh, liquid nitrogen, for example. Um, if you had boiling liquid nitrogen and we touched it, um, it would feel extremely cold to us because that temperature at which it boils is much colder than our room temperature. So again, trying to get away from our concept of just how it feels to us and more talk about energy in versus energy out for these topics. If we flip that idea and we go to what happens if you freeze something, Okay, or another term for that is solidification, and condense something, or condensing something. Uh, what we see here, to go from a liquid to a solid in the freezing process, you had to reduce your energy. Same thing for condensing. When you go from a gas to a liquid, 
the only way you can get that phase change is if you reduce your energy. So when you're freezing or you're condensing, both cases you have to, that substance or that system has to release the energy to someplace else so it can go into a lower energy state, meaning it has to be an exothermic process. So even though freezing we kind of feel as being really cold to us, um, the reality is when you freeze something, it releases energy, so it's exothermic. The example I often give is if you're going to have an early frost or an early freeze in an apple orchard or a, a citrus orchard down south, um, a lot of times what farmers will do is they will actually spray down their crops with a bunch of water. And they do that because they want the water to actually freeze. They don't want the fruit to freeze. So what happens is, as it gets colder, the water on the fruit freezes. And as it freezes, it releases that little bit of extra energy it has into the fruit, which helps keep the fruit warm. And then it insulates the fruit in kind of an ice shell. And then it keeps the fruit from actually freezing on the inside. Okay, um, It's kind of like how our lakes in Minnesota work also, where the top freezes and the water underneath doesn't freeze because the ice actually acts as a barrier or an insulator for the rest of uh, the lake as it freezes over. So, um, so we're talking here, freezing, condensing, both exothermic. Okay, we're going to end this segment here. Uh, our next segment is going to start talking about the different laws of thermodynamics. Thank you.